Hello, Eugene Aiello here. We're going to continue on our uh, biophotonics series. Um, last video again, a little complicated, but I hope you followed it because we're going to keep building upon it. Um, it's a lot of the things I talked about, I'll keep on mentioning over and over again because they apply. This is uh, expanding upon itself. I'm trying to produce these videos in such a way that there's order to it. So before I start a topic, hopefully you understand the previous. Um, this video, though, I'm going to break that rule. I'm going to mention something today that uh, I haven't in this video that I haven't brought up yet, and that's structuring a water and how structuring and destructuring a water is a way that the uh, the cell uses charge separation within structured water to move things to uh, allow ion channels to uh, to flux. Meaning, if, if there's a structured state of water around a protein. When uh, ATP is bound to that protein, it will be in that structured state. But as you break that bond, it changes the state of the proton, and there's an electron flowing through the protein through that protein that's going to change the nature of structuring a water around the protein, creating a wave of structured water destructuring, and so on and so forth. So we're going to mention that in nerve conduction. But anyway, let me get on topic here. Um, this video, we're going to discuss glial cells. Glial cells are not just glue. In Latin, glial cells, glial translates into glue. So conventional science views this uh, very intricate network of, um, of neuron-linked cells as being nothing more than support structures. Um, they, they don't account for them being as vital as they are, where I think the glial cell network is the quantum network within the body, meaning I, I spoke last video about how the cell, that microtubule network within the cell is the quantum network of that cell. But there's this electromagnetic force, this, this, this quantum, the quantum, um, um, why, why is the word slipping me now? But there's, there's a uh, coherent, a coherent energy running throughout the body that every cell is picking up different frequencies of that coherent signal. So that electromagnetic energy, that cumulative biophotonic energy absorbed by the pigment systems is traveling through the glial system. The glial system doesn't just transmit this to and from the body, it's also processing it in the central glial system. So in the central nervous system, glial cells will outnumber neurons six to one. And the amount of connectivity between neurons that you get with the glial cell network is amazing. So we're going to start with the types of glial cells just in the central nervous system. We'll erase the board and then we'll talk about the peripheral nervous system, but the central nervous system is the most complicated. So the first type of glial cell in the central nervous system is the astrocytes. Astrocytes will, they're the most numerous, there's way more astrocytes than any of the rest of these cells, but they connect multiple neurons together. Astrocytes are also responsible for guiding when neurons make new connections. So when there's processing, there's neuroplasticity, it's the astrocytes that are guiding those neural network connections. So astrocytes are gonna be our big networkers within this central glial system. The oligodendrites, they cover every neuron with a myelin sheath in the central nervous system. So basically they're, they're the same as Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. But myelin covering over nerves increases the conduction velocity of nerves. So if we're looking down here at a nerve, we've got the oligodendrites surrounding the axon of the nerve. So the axon is the longest part of transmission of the nerve fibers. So they wrap around those, they coil around those nerves, and they have these little nodes called the nodes of Ranvier. So there's spaces in between each one of these glial cells. I find it amazing that just at that space is a high concentration of mitochondria within the nerve. So basically, when I was talking about that there's a water destructuring, there's a flow of electron through proteins that's causing water to destructure around it, allowing for different transmission of ions to go through the barrier, your peripheral cytoskeletal network within the axon is going to, when it's getting an electron flow through it from cleaving of ATP, that electron is going to move through that network. As that happens, that's what's allowing the depolarization of the nerve and the setup of the action potential. So you have one state where that peripheral cytoskeleton is bound to ATP and water is structured around it. When a nerve fires, that ATP is cleaved and that electron actually flows down that nerve. 
with saltatory conduction with this myelin sheath, what's happening is that this oligodendrite or Schwann cell in the peripheral nervous system is feeding that electromagnetic energy of those cytochromes. This Schwann cell is making that mitochondria happen within that nerve axon. So what's happening is as that electrical flow gets to that node, it gets recharged again in zinc. So we're getting a speed up of that electron flow because as electrons move, they're eventually going to slow down. Electrons aren't like light. Light travels at a consistent speed where electrical flow through that peripheral cytoskeleton, it's going to be bouncing through, as we talked earlier, at those in those cores within those proteins. It's going to have that semiconductor nature, nature where there's diode flow of that electron going through, but it's eventually going to slow down. Why is it going to slow down? How many times is it hopping and dropping and hopping and dropping? When it's doing that, it's exciting an electron within that protein, and then it's dropping down in charge, emitting some thermal energy. So there's some heat produced as this electron flow goes through that peripheral cytoskeleton. So these two cells, very important for the glial system we're going to talk about. There's three other cells within the glial system. We're not going to ignore them. They're, they're obviously serving important functions. The microglial cells are literally immune cells. The central nervous system has a barrier, the blood-brain barrier. So the brain has its own immune system. Is it purely just an immune system? Probably not. It's probably there to clean up things that aren't working so well. So if we've got mitochondria is going bananas, I guess we haven't talked about that yet. Mitochondria is out of control, that that ROS production is out of balance. These guys are going to be there to clean up anything before it becomes a problem. Um, epidermal cells. Epidermal cells are located in the ventricles, anywhere in the canals within the brain where there's cerebral spinal fluid. They're going to produce the cerebral spinal fluid. The radial cells. These are fun ones. Stem cells. Our central nervous system has stem cells within it. Stem cells that can become anything. They can become glial cells. They can become neurons. Learning to tap how to get that stem cell activated is going to be pretty important for future progress within the neurosciences. We have what we need already sitting in there. For some reason, that system just isn't functioning. So say there is, I don't know, uh, a, a glioblastoma of some sort, a cancer within the body. Um, you would think that these stem cells would be able to make up for the lost cells or if there's a stroke. So there's something to this system. I'm going to touch upon it later when we talk about embryology. Um, it, during embryology, there's going to be a cell I'm going to call the master cell, which is the original cell, the first fertilized egg that has the capability when we talked last time about how those different centrioles are oriented and the process of stem cell production is a matter of how those dipoles are connected. Well, that original first cell, the first fertilized egg, I believe every option is available, meaning every dipole antenna is set up. Is it possible that these guys are still master cells that sit within the central nervous system, just waiting to be woken up by the proper frequency if the body can still produce that frequency as it ages? As we age, we lose ability to regenerate. Um, what I mean by that is uh, salamanders can regenerate a limb, and there's some type of system, and I detail it greatly in the beginning of my book, um, the work of Dr. Becker, with regeneration, and he was finding that the signal of regeneration, the information that tells a limb how to grow was within a system that parallels the nervous system, but doesn't seem to work by the conventional firing of nerves or chemical transmitters. He was starting to believe, just like the onion guy figured out, that there was an invisible force. There was something that activated that. So what is it about an animal that regenerates and the animal that doesn't regenerate? That ability to produce that frequency that re activates those master cells. So keep radial cells in mind when I talk about master cells during embryology. So I'm going to clean up this board and we're going to start talking about what's in the peripheral nervous system. So in the peripheral nervous system, we have two types of glial cells. Schwann cells, which I discussed earlier, are those myelinating cells, basically in increasing conduction velocity in neurons. Satellite cells, they're very similar to astrocytes. They're going to wrap around the cell body of the different neurons. They're going to be located in ganglia. So something that can be kind of complicated for people that are not in the field of medicine is we got a cross-section of the spinal cord. 
our sensory neurons are one cell body, meaning a sensory neuron that goes from your L4 vertebra down into your big toe, that axon is one cell. So the cell body is an area called the dorsal root ganglia that's right along by the spinal cord. And here's your gray matter. And then it attaches into those sensory circuits that go up through the central nervous system. So you would see Schwann cells located the whole distance of that axon. But what's interesting is when you get over to this dorsal root ganglion, you have satellite cells which wrap around this. Now this is very important for what I was researching in the beginning because, um, and hopefully in the next video I talk about this, my clinical experience with the lasers that led me to follow the system. If, if electromagnetic energy is coming through the nervous system and it's not going through the neurons, but it's traveling through the glial cells, the Schwann cells, it has to be a complete circuit into the system. I think I discussed earlier that different neurons will have gaps within them. They're synaptic clefts that these synaptic clefts must be crossed somehow. These glial cells will pass through those synaptic clefts. So you're gonna have a glial cell continuation that goes over that synapse in the spinal cord. So you have one complete circuit that's running that information. So if electromagnetic energy is traveling via the system, it, it is not going through those neurons. It's following through the Schwann cells, then it's following through the satellite cells. Now what's interesting about the satellite cells they're wrapping around multiple cell bodies, meaning multiple sensory neurons that are coming up into this dorsal root ganglion. Those satellite cells will form networks around them. The same thing is gonna be occurring in the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system, we have ganglia that are near the paraspinal ganglia, the sympathetic nervous system. You have ganglia that are near the spinal cord. You also have some ganglia that are actually within the viscera. These different ganglia are also covered by these satellite cells. So I think these satellite cells function as a processor of the quantum input. So it's organizing everything as it's bringing it up through the system. So with this system, what I was discovering when I was experimenting with uh, how cold lasers were actually interacting with the nervous system, I devised a, a, a theory that these pigment systems in the skin, the melanocytes, are absorbing this electromagnetic energy. In that melanocyte, we've got the microtubule system. It's absorbing the electromagnetic energy in those melanosomes that are attached to the microtubules. That microtubule system is then processing this information. It's used to run that melanocyte, just like the, I said, the keratinocytes that are near it also are absorbing electromagnetic energy into their little system. But these melanocytes are specifically producing biofrequencies that are going into this glial system. Within the microtubule cells of the glial system, this electromagnetic energy at a very specific frequency, depending on nerve level, is gonna bring that information up into the thalamus. So what the thalamus is, is a sensory relay station. So if we're looking at cortex, and then in the midbrain we have our thalamus. All sensory information that's coming in is going into the thalamus of the opposite side of the body. I believe we have our binary data that's coming through our nerves, our sense of touch, vision, all the different things that go through the thalamus except for smell are traveling through the nerves up to the thalamus. But I also think that electromagnetic energy is doing the same thing. So all these different frequencies that are coming from all the different nerve le levels are the quantum input into the thalamus. From there, and this is where we get into my clinical experience, from there, there's a rhythm between the thalamus and the cortex. When I say that, I don't just mean cortex. This could be firing to your cerebellum, your midbrain, your limbic. So it could be firing anywhere within the nervous system. But Everything starts in the thalamus sensory input wise and quantum input wise, and it goes from there to different areas. What's interesting about the thalamus is the cortex and the different areas fire back to the thalamus. This creates something called the thalamocortical loop. So my clinical experience, 
I work as a functional chiropractic neurologist, meaning I'm not looking at patients to line vertebra, um, very old subluxation model of chiropractic. Newer models are saying that chiropractic is working as a sensory input, meaning joint receptors within the, the spine, especially in the cervical spine, have a lot of sensory receptors in them. Proprioception is the biggest input sensory-wise into this thalamus. Vision and hearing are number two and number three. All other sensory stimulation, the thalamus is pretty minor compared to those three. So as a chiropractor, we started looking at these rhythms can go out of function. If we get deafferentation, meaning sensory input is just not up to par. Um, as a chiropractor, we say it's from restriction of joints. Those vertebral joints that have a lot of receptors can get locked up, not move. When they're not moving, they're not sending input up to that thalamus, decreasing the frequency of firing rate from the thalamus to the cortex, setting this thalamocortical loop out of rhythm. So thalamocortical loop dysrhythmias is what they're called, has been associated with a lot of different functional neurologic disorders, tinnitus, um, I've read papers on obsessive compulsive disorder, spectrum disorders, um, ADHD, um, visual snow, even some there saying that Parkinson's disease, disease and Alzheimer's exhibit thalamocortical dysrhythmias. Um, different methods are working on trying to restore this. Um, biofeedback, brain mapping, they're trying to use cortical to thalamo inputs, activations to put this back into rhythm. What I was interested in when I was early in practice, I'm a sports med doc. Orthopedics, neurology is what I work with. When someone has a thalamocortical dysrhythmia, that side of their body, they're going to get an imbalance of flexor extensor tone, meaning anti-gravity muscles posturally are going to go out of balance. So we're going to have a weakness pattern in the front of the lower body, T6 down, weakness pattern T6 up in the posterior body, opposing muscle group is going to be hypertonic. So you're going to get an imbalance that leads to many of the chronic pains that I treat. Using chiropractic adjustments, if I do a spinal manipulation from the opposite side of the body, I'm going to activate that thalamocortical dysrhythmia and correct that postural tone imbalance. What I discovered in 2019 was I started seeing patients that were exhibiting thalamocortical dysrhythmias that were much worse than I had seen for the last 22 years of practice and they were occurring more often on the opposite side of the body that was common. What I mean by that is these TCDs were more common on the right side of the body. Um, left sides would occur sometimes, but they usually corrected pretty quickly, and then the patient would exhibit a right TCD. Um, summer of 2019, I started finding everybody was presenting with left TCDs, and chiropractic manipulations were not correcting it. Um, by happenstance, one of my students had a, a theory that a, a different model of uh, myofascial techniques mixed with laser stimulus. Um, it's called anatomy trains protocols if you're interested in reading about it. Basically saying fascial planes, muscles are oriented in fascial planes. And these fascial planes correlated to acupuncture channels. Um, I started experimenting with that technique thinking maybe this TCD has nothing to do with chiropractic and maybe I was fixing these these imbalances I was seeing because I was working with acupuncture meridians just by happenstance of adjusting the spine because there's a meridian that runs along your spine. So we were experimenting with this technique and we were using the cold laser. We found that when we were using cold laser stimulus on the C5, C6, C7 nerve dermatones in the hand, that was correcting this left side and imbalance that I wasn't able to correct with any other techniques. Um, that opened up the door to all this research that I've been talking about. So when I'm using a cold laser stimulus on a certain nerve level, we'll say C5, that cold laser stimulus was somehow affecting the opposite thalamus. Um, that makes no sense if you're looking at it from a conventional view because that cold laser stimulus is not going to be firing a binary nerve axon, meaning I'm not gonna elicit an action potential with a cold laser. Um, there's research out there saying that cold lasers may facilitate it, but there was no sensory stimulus. If I put a red laser on your hand versus a blue laser, you couldn't distinguish the two part. If I had it off, you wouldn't know if I had it off or on. So this system was revealed to me 
this quantum system, when you're using a laser, you're not penetrating all the way into those muscles like I talked about in the first visit, in effect, your first video, and affecting those cytochromes within the mitochondria. Somehow that cold laser is affecting this quantum system. So I believe that within this thalamus, the interneuron networks. So what's an interneuron network? Well, you have the sensory neurons coming in and they're gonna be synapsing to a neuron that's within the thalamus, which is then gonna synapse to other neurons which progress out to the other parts of the nervous system. I believe that this interneuron network is the quantum processing area. So when I was talking about astrocytes, earlier glial cells, I think these astrocyte networks within the thalamus are functioning based off of a quantum input, meaning this frequency that I found with the laser, it's not, it has no information. It, it's just electromagnetic energy entering the system. When that electromagnetic energy enters this thalamus, we're getting every different frequency possible between the red, green, and blue spectrum, depending on nerve level. Cervical nerve levels are working in the red spectrum to about T4. We get to T4, we're going into green frequencies until about L2, and then from there down we go blue. When I mentioned those triplets and how I was excited that it correlated to what I was finding, when I was experimenting with laser stimulus, I was seeing what frequencies on what nerves we're having the neurologic reaction that would dissipate that muscle imbalance. What I mean by that is if this thalamocortical rhythm is off, if I take a light and I shine it in the right eye and hit that medial retina, which is going to cross to left thalamus, I can get this thalamocortical dysrhythmia to temporarily be better. I could see it in muscle tone. I could do muscle testing. I could check, check muscle tone. Light would do that. I was finding the laser would do that, but it only did it if I had the proper frequency laser on the sensory nervatome, nerve dermatome that correlated to that frequency. So hopefully you follow that. It took me forever experimenting. I purchased so many different lasers of all different frequencies and was using them as sensory stimulus to map out this system. So I think that this system is dependent on quantum input for that quantum system to start. So none of this has anything to do with information. It's just quantum energy. So in that same thought, if you're looking at quantum computers, which at this point they're theoretic in the, in the arena of using photonic input to interact with the system. Currently, the quantum computers are working with charged particles, which is not the most optimal way. Um, but working with photons is very tricky in a lab setting. Um, you have to be at a very cold temperature, absolute zero, and you can have no electromagnetic interference or the system's going to collapse. I think Mother Nature has figured this out. When we were talking about um, semiconductors and the variability within those, those amino acid residues and the complexity of semiconduction that can be created in that core, I think all these different frequencies of input are going to act on that core differently. When you're interacting with these frequencies within the mitochondrial network, that quantum processing network, the data is stored within that network. So quantum energy from inputs is going to interact in the microtubule system, and you're going to get a different processing. Your, your different data is going to be expressed. So when I was saying this coherent frequency, the coherent frequency that's coming into the system is every one of these frequencies. Once it's in the system and we move into the cortex and we move into that central glial system, the astrocytes, the processing within the system is that coherent wave. It's gonna have an output that's gonna to communicate to every cell of the body. And when I say communicate, no data. This coherent wave doesn't carry information. It's not like a cell phone. A cell phone signal, electromagnetic energy has data embedded within the wave and a binary signal. This quantum data is just energy. That energy is going to absorb into those different sensorial arrangements we discussed earlier, and they're going to elicit a different quantum energy within the microtubule network of that cell. So these sensory glial cells are only bringing the quantum input in. So those Schwann cells, they're just carrying it. Those satellite cells, they may be processing and integrating a little bit, but nothing's going to start happening until you get into this inner neuron network of the thalamus. From there, the quantum system gets kicked in. Very complicated. I mentioned earlier Justin Riddle. 
fabulous. Um, I've watched almost every one of his videos. Could I repeat it in a lecture like this? No, <laughs> I, that, that's not my area. My area, like I said, is orthopedics. And I found this to be quite the amazing discovery that cold lasers are affecting neurology. From there, I knew there was a system and that's what this entire series has been about. That's what my book is about. I created a theoretic biophotonic system. Is my system perfect? No, it's, it's a starting point. Um, I want to talk about my other clinical experience with the cold laser that's going to be a, a very interesting little topic. So I'm going to erase this board and I'm going to come back. So my other clinical experience that uh, had me mystified for many years, I'm going to say it's about 16 years now I've been doing an allergy treatment with a cold laser. Um, I discovered this treatment, I, I knew about it for many years, it just seemed kind of crazy when I was learning about it. Um, it was based off a, a technique called NAET, uh, Allergy Elim Elimination Technique. I can't remember the lady's name, not Narubi, Narabi, Allergy Elimination Technique. Anyway, she was a homeopath and she created this uh, system to treat allergies with homeopathic remedies. Um, she sold a kit that had vials that were literally just, it was water in the vial. Supposedly they had a method that can impart the, the, the frequency of energy of the allergen, say cat hair, into this vial, and that vial now had the frequency of that. Um, the method worked even more of a wacky way. You, you would take these different vials and put them on someone's stomach and you would test their strength. If when the vial was on them, it uh, made them weak, that was an interaction. And the uh, theory was energy of what was in the vial and energy of your biofield, which again, wacky to me at that time, um, something to do with acupuncture, they didn't cooperate and it would make you weak, an alarm reaction. You would use a cold red laser, a 635 nanometer red laser on uh, acupuncture points, large intestine 4, 11, spleen 6, liver 3, while that substance was on the person and it would eliminate the allergy. Um, yeah, when I was exposed to it, I, I, I thought it was crazy until it came to me having to experiment with it to keep a dog. Um, I got a new dog that my wife was allergic to and we tried everything and I started playing with the NAET. I knew someone that did it and I borrowed his samples and it did, she didn't react to the samples and one of them was cat, which she was asthmatic to. Um, when I talked to him about it, he said, that, that kit's not perfect. He's like, if you think it's a dog, brush the dog's hair. Long story short, brush the dog's hair, she reacted. I did the treatment, it fixed her allergy. So I started doing that in my office. I created my own kit. Um, free of charge for a couple weeks just to see if it worked and I was blown away. I had fixed an anaphylactic latex allergy in that period. Multiple milk, cat, dog, couldn't believe it. Um, that quickly became a small part of my practice and my scientific explanation for it was energy of you, energy of it, don't cooperate. Something about those acupuncture points made your body accept it. Um, when I discovered that laser and the neurologic reaction, I started rethinking this as I was putting together my model. If you remember a few videos back, I talked about the Langerhans cells, that immune sentinel that's in the skin, in the epidermis, it's in your mucous membranes, liver, spleen, a few other places in your body. Um, that Langerhans cell is embryologically derived from your glial cells. So your glial cells produce the Langerhans cells a synaptic connection between the nerve and the glial cell remains intact even in adulthood. So my theory on this is that an allergy, first off, is, is a misrecognition, meaning an allergic response is you're reacting to something that's not harmful as though it is um, by an IgE, immune-related response. IgE would normally only be seen if you were exposed to a parasite or a toxin, meaning the only normal time that you would have this histamine response would be a parasite or a toxin. So basically in an allergy, your body is thinking that cat hair is a nematode of some sort, you know, something it, in its memory bank, somehow it's getting mixed up. It's, it's, it's a misidentity of what the Langerhans cell, cell is sensing. My belief is that these Langerhans cells are sensing the near infrared energy of the things around us. We have these things called Brubeck granules within the Langerhans cells. Conventional science really doesn't understand what they're for. They believe those Brubeck granules ingest the different whatever <laughs> invader and process it for that antigen. That's how the antigen is recognized and then forwarded over those B cells for the antibody production. 
When I was looking at electron microscopy or Brebeck granules, they have these unusual structures that look like tennis rackets. Well, in my study, when I was learning about how antennas work, you can have something called a circular dipole antenna with a ground in it. So dipole antennas are if circular dipoles are an effective way to capture radio signals that are very small, millimeter. So near infrared energy, I believe, is getting sensed by these Langerhans cells. Through that microtubule network, it is sending the information of what that is into the system. So we're recognizing the electromagnetic energy of the cat hair. How does the cat hair get confused with nematode? Well, that glial system is going to transmit up to the thalamus whatever it just sensed. In this interneuron network, if those quantum inputs I was just discussing a minute ago are off frequency, they're not at the, the level they should be. And I'm going to discuss why that is in a minute. But if these inputs are not at the frequency they should be, it's going to affect the messaging within this network. So that network is going to go out with the wrong message to the cortex. The cortex, and when I say cortex, I'm talking the astrocyte, the glial cell network. Glial cell network has all the data. It has all the memory of what things are. So nematode and cat hair near infrared frequencies must be close. So if there's a slight shift off of frequencies, we're going to think that <clears throat> that cat hair is a nematode. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so I call this allergy technique now not energy of you, energy of it, I call it an energy frequency miscommunication. To fix this, that 635 nanometer cold red laser, when you apply it to dermatones, so when I said large intestine 4 and 11, that's a large dermatone. That's the C5, C6 dermatone you're stimulating there. Down in the foot, you're doing L4, L5 dermatones. Those are huge dermatones, meaning with this quantum system, lots of frequencies, lots of electromagnetic energy is coming up that system. Well, if the near infrared frequency is off, using the red frequency, any frequency of that matter, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, is going to shift that quantum frequency back into tune in the thalamus. If I was to use a near infrared laser, the treatment doesn't work. If I use a 650 nanometer red versus a 635, the treatment doesn't work. So there's something about this system that it's, it's, a, it's a shifting of frequencies within the thalamus of the quantum input. Um, what's setting that system off? I'm going to leave that for the next video. Um, something is interacting with these quantum inputs. Those quantum inputs are coming into that thalamus slightly out of tune. When that's slightly out of tune, it's affecting how that Langerhans cells recognizing the environment, creating allergic responses. But it's also affecting other things. If these quantum frequencies are shifted off tune, this whole coherent signal is going to be slightly out of tune and different physiologic functions can be affected. So we're going to discuss that in the next video.